guys, Stents here, also known as Alpha 5, also known as Andrew, also known as Stents the Boss, whatever else. Uh, and today we got something tiny bit different from the norm, but just the same. We got a deck profile for you. Um, this is one of the next uh, decks in the tournament. This was a donation deck. This is not something we built, but it is kind of interesting. Um, here we have the Darkness Nature... I'm going to call it Tempo... Maybe it's aggro. It's certainly not mid range. Um, yeah, so let's let's get right into it. Uh, there's a lot of interesting deck building choices here, but I see where they're coming from a lot of the time. To me, this seems like either a beginner or someone had like a pet deck and they sent it in, and it wasn't entirely done or it was still being tested. But I, there's a lot of cool ideas in here I really like. Uh, so first, I'm gonna talk about. I'm just gonna talk in the in order of mana curve here. So we've got. First, one drops, two Forsaken Puppet. Uh, this card's a lot of fun, especially if you're going first. Um, if you're going first, you can slap an overcosted one drop minion for absolutely no uh, downside. It comes in tapped, and then by the time your opponent can actually play anything, it's untapped anyway, and you don't worry about it. Uh, if you're going second, it can get a little bit dicey because there are some blockers that match up with this thing, and if your opponent wants to proactively keep you off the board, you'll have a bit of a problem. Uh, so the blocker can bump. Um, but it can pay off a lot of the time, and it's an evil toy, which is kind of cool. You don't see a lot of those. Uh, second, we got Blade Mane. This is just a vanilla 2-mana two 2k uh, nature dude. It's it's fine. It exists. Uh, it's a body. Again, it's a common, so I'm, I'm assuming that this was an unfinished or beginner's deck. Uh, Lurking Skullcutter, another common, but this card's really good. Um... I love this because it's a proactive aggro tool. It keeps your opponent on the back foot. It makes them really think about what they're blocking with, and it keeps you attacking. Um, next, we got three, Pouncing Crickent. Uh, this is primarily a Shield Blast creature. It kind of feels bad to play it on two. You'd rather just play the Blade Main or pretty much any of the other two drops. Uh, however, the Crickent uh, is really good because it provides evolution bait for some of our stuff later in the deck. So that's why there's three of it. Um... Moving on, Wandering Brain Eater, Blocker Guard, uh, and enters Battle Zone Taps. This is, it's similar to um, Skeeter Swarmer, or as I always think of a Bloody Squido, because I've never gotten that name out of my head, uh, from the Duel Masters days. Uh, except instead of when it wins a battle, it dies, this one enters the Battle Zone Taps, similar to the Forsaken Puppet. So, uh, the the benefit of this, right, is you get something way over costed for two mana with very little downside. Uh, the trade-off, I guess, is A, it enters the battle zone tapped, so if it comes down late game, your opponent can trade over it immediately. And B, obviously, just like all darkness blockers, it's got guard. So, uh, because it doesn't have a skirmisher, it's not helping you proactively trade or kind of keep control of the board on your own terms, so the the fact that it's that overstated doesn't help you as much as we wish it did. Uh, moving on, uh, Ardu Ranger. Uh, three mana, one thousand powerful attack plus three thousand, plus two thousand. I'm sorry, uh, and mana infused. When it dies, uh, it ramps you, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, this keeps the ramp train growing. It's another aggressive card that uh, is green evolution bait, and your opponent will think twice about killing it because it ramps you towards your uh, bigger threats. Second, two attic reaper. Um, this was, uh, this has always been kind of a fun pet card, but, uh, it's always been kind of underwhelming. However, the target creature gets minus 2,000 unleash ability is really nice, um, because it can take out either something that's overcosted and has come into effect already, such as, like, a Master Trader's Ophelia. Um, it can help you trade over a blocker that, or a creature that you absolutely critically need to kill, or it could just outright kill a small chump blocker at the one or two mana cost, which is super nice. Um, so there's a lot of versatility here, and again, it just keeps the pressure on, right? Like, this isn't a big finisher, this is just something to scare your opponent out. Um, keep them on their back foot, kind of make their decisions uncomfortable or difficult. Next, we got three Goop Striker. Uh, I absolutely love Goop Striker. I, I've always thought this was a really fun card. Um, it's never quite measured up to some of the other similar cards in its cycle. Um, uh, Vicious Test Subject, the, the black-blue version, is uh, unblockable and Slayer, which is a little bit better than uh, Ramp Slayer. Uh, what is it? Targusher, the white-black Slayer, is 
tap something when it dies, and it's an enforcer, which is exceptionally relevant. But Goop Striker's got its own niche role here. Um, being able to bump into something as well as ramp you is super valuable because you really don't get the as much of the downside for sacrificing your dudes. Uh, especially in an aggro deck, this also means that once again your opponent is really hesitant to block against this guy, and uh, it really makes your opponent's summons and trades and attacks really, really difficult for them, if all goes to plan. So, uh, real fun card here. Uh, Mind Rack Moth. This card is slept on a lot, I think. Uh, it isn't uncommon, and I don't think it ever got too much, if any, competitive play, but uh, A... First, when you play it, even if you don't get the rest of its effect off, you can see your opponent's hand. As an aggro deck, which this primarily is, uh, you really have to be aware of what your opponent has and play around it to the best of your ability. If you can't do that, you're not only going to have a bad time, you're going to get blown out. Next, uh, us choosing a spell from your opponent's hand and getting rid of it is great. Piercing Judgment, gone. Get out of here. Tornado Flame, gone. Get out of here. Uh, what else? Uh, Drill Storm, incredibly choice. Great, get it out. Uh, Bone Blades, get it out. I could go on, right? Like, critical threats that are really gonna make things difficult for you, or really take your foot off your get off the gas and the uh, aggression, will suddenly get stopped in their tracks. That's super valuable. Um, uh, it is a little bit under-costed, or understated, I'm sorry, but a lot of the deck varies between understated and way overstated with the downside. So, that's fine. I think there's enough overstated cards here to kind of justify it. Um, plus, a lot of the understated cards will be evolved onto anyway. Uh, Night Haunt. This is your 3-5 Bloody Squido. I think a Bone Spider was like this back in the original Duel Masters days. Uh, but it's it's the same. 3-5 uh, blocker guard. When it wins, kill it. Um, this thing's job, just like some of the other blockers, they're really not supposed to be blocking here. They're sit on board, they make your opponent think hard about trading into your things or make the trades uncomfortable, and then when they become useless and can't attack and you hit turn 5 or 6, uh, you evolve onto them, and now all of a sudden you get an extra attacker that's a double breaker and gets a benefit. Um, so it does its job fairly well. Uh, this one doesn't come in tapped, which is great, because if it came in tapped on turn three, uh, that's a really critical turn in terms of aggression and people starting to get their blockers online. So, uh, it's, it's really important. I would rather have it be unstable as opposed to coming in tapped like the Wandering Brainy or the Forsaken Puppet. Uh, next, we got the Nurturing Hive. Um, you tap one less mana to summon creatures. We run a grand total of six spells in this whole deck. There's 41 cards in this deck. Uh, so, what, 35 out of 41 is a great percentage, uh, reducing the cost of everything. There are more critical four drops that I would have liked to play over this. But again, it's an uncommon. Uh, it helps you just get to your stuff faster. Sometimes getting to an evolution creature one turn earlier is the difference between victory and a defeat. So... It's, it's a powerful card, and it has come in handy before. Um, it pairs better with draw than anything else, so I might have liked to see blue splashed in here if I tried to remake this deck. But, um, you know, it's fine. Terror Hound. This is your beat stick. This uh, is a big dude on four to, again, just make trades difficult for your opponents. Um, great evolution bait, because it's multi-civ, obviously. And... I mean, yeah, the, the races aren't relevant. All of our evolutions here, thankfully, are, uh, what's the word? Civilization-based evolutions as opposed to race-based evolutions. So we don't have to worry about that. Uh, next, we'll go to Vinebind. Um, this is... Uh, how do I explain this? So, after... I think it was after the end of year one, maybe year two, Wizards of the Coast at a winter championship, they said, hey, yeah, um, level-based removal is way too good. We'll be moving towards power-based removal instead. So Bone Blades and Return to the Stoil got turned into Vinebind and... I forget. The Bone Blades... Uh, Ghost Bite. Ghost Bite. Because they, they moved it down to 3,000. Because Darkness is a little bit overcosted in that regard. Um, Vine Bind, with that said, is still premium removal. Uh, again, it just keeps your opponent on the back foot. The ramp isn't exactly relevant because we're trying to run... 
we're trying to, to outrace our opponent anyway. If we're ramping them one, or maybe at worst two, if it's a small evolution creature, then they may put a big threat down, but we've got enough slayers and removal in this deck that is not awful. So, it's a good card. Again, I would have preferred a more proactive 4-drop, something that can impact the board a little bit more, but Vinebind's not awful. Uh, I think it's it's a fine choice. Next, 2 and Jack. I would have loved to see this as 3, but again, because I think this is like a budget for starting out deck, I, I don't think they had 3 when they donated it to us. Uh, and Jack's just super powerful. It's a huge body. It evolves some of our, uh, we'll call them lesser creatures, such as a Crickent or a Blade Mane. Uh, maybe even a Hive if you absolutely need it. I've done that before. Um, and it keeps the pressure on regardless of if your opponent can kill it or not. Hey, it's turn five. I'm swinging in with this dude. There's almost no chance that you have a blocker that can stop me right now. I'm breaking two shields. Or I'm taking out a critical blocker so my, the rest of my, uh, my chump dudes can go in and break some shields. Oh, you killed it with something? Great. I don't care. I'll take something out of my mana and put it back out. Um, because of that, it's extremely relevant. Uh, even more relevant, it's bigger than Blinder Beetle Prime which is, on the same turn, which is incredibly important. Blinder Beetle Prime is one of the best cards in the game, and that's part of the reason Anjak got as much play as it did in the competitive days, because you got to get over Blinder Beetle Prime. It's just that important. Next, we move on to our six drops, and we have three different evos here. I like the 2-2-2 two, two, two split for versatility. Um, I would have preferred any one of these to be a, more of a three drop, preferably either the Whip Tongue or the Bristling Tatsurion, but, uh, you know, again, they're all promos, so it's fine. Uh, first, uh, I'm going to read this card out because, honestly, I forget what this thing does half the time. Evolution, double breaker, so it just goes on a, on a nature creature, 6 mana, 8,000. It's a good stat line. Um, when this creature has... Uh, 12,000 power or more, it has triple breaker, okay, so that's the same rule that most cards have. Uh, Quill Spike Defender, all your other creatures can't be attacked. This is nutty good, especially when your opponent has uh, a bunch of blockers, or I'm sorry, when your opponent doesn't have blockers, but they have a big board to kind of try and counter swing at you. Uh, this basically says I get free attacks. Um, unleash, for every other creature you have in the battle zone, this creature gets plus 8,000 power. Am I reading that right? I'm sorry, the card, the image isn't very clear here. I'm going to expand this a little bit. Plus 3,000 power. Yeah, 8,000 would be stupid. No. <laughs> For each other creature you have in the battle zone, this creature gets plus 3,000 power until the start of your next turn. Um, so you need... Yeah, you just need two other creatures alongside this in order for it to get up to a triple breaker. Uh, with that said, the point of this deck is that you should be swinging at least a little before that point, so I'm not sure how relevant the triple breaker always gets, but extra power is always super good. Uh, this thing could very easily get over an Eternal Haven. Um, this thing very easily could uh, threaten some really relevant threats like Cassiopeia, Cassiopeia. Uh, so this thing gets a lot of mileage, and I would say this is probably one of the two MVPs of the deck, by a mile. Next, we got two Oblivion Knights. Uh, this was a promo for the Gauntlet set premieres. They really wanted to show off the um, evolutions on Civ instead of evolutions on Race. So 6 mana, 7,000. Still a decent stat line. Could have been a little bit bigger. Um, evolution, your opponent chooses and discards two cards. Uh, your opponent choosing isn't great, but by turn 6, 7, unless you're in a control matchup... Uh, your opponent probably only has between two and four cards, so discarding two of them is a lot. And again, it really makes your, limits your opponent's options, keep them on the back foot. Uh, last card in the regular creature package, we got Ravenous Whip Tongue. Um, six mana, 6k, it's kind of small. However, Evolution, uh, Double Breaker, uh, once again, it's an Evolution on Darkness. Uh, unleash, Banish, tar uh, Target, Tapped Enemy Creature. Downside, it targets, so, uh... I'm sorry, let me rephrase. Uh, unleash, banish, target, untapped enemy creature. That's a lot better. Um, again, downside, uh, it has to target. So something like a Keeper of Laws or a Tricky Turnip are not going to get targeted by this because they can't be. Same with like a uh, Haven or what is it, King Neptus, the blue 5 mana 5 5 Leviathan. Um, but. With that said, this thing takes out uh, big blockers easily. This thing takes out critical threats easily. This thing takes out 
uh, your opponent's key hitters that they're never going to attack with, and we have no tap for in this deck. Uh, so, things like, for example, a Serpent's the Spirit Shifter, right? Like, every time you, you kill one of their blockers or one of their small dudes, they get a shield out of it. That would blow this deck out of the water. I swing, I hit two shields, I kill the Serpents, no effect for you. Um, like I say, the 6,000 power is a little bit unfortunate because it isn't a very aggressive stat line, and the fact that the Unleash only goes off one time because it only evolves on one creature, unless you put this on top of, like, another evolution creature or something, is a little bit unfortunate, but uh, the card does what it needs to, and once again, just like I've been saying this whole time, keeps opponent on the back foot. It's critical. Uh, last four cards of the deck, you got three Root Trap, and you got uh, one Terror Pit. They're all just critical removal. Uh, the Root Traps are really good, the same as the Vine Binds, at removing um, things that recur a whole lot, such as um, Underworld Stalker. So that's absolutely critical. Uh, I think that would probably be my main point of inclusion for the Vine Binds. However, uh, looking at the mana count, if you're wondering why it's three Root Trap and one Terror Pit, a, maybe they just didn't have enough, and B, if I'm counting very quickly, two, uh, three Crickens, three Root Traps, uh, two Ardu Ranger, three Goop Striker, two Nurturing Hive, two Terror Hound, two Vine Bind, two Anjak, two Bristling, uh, and then we have two Forsaken, two Lurking, three Brain Eater, Two Reaper, again, three Group Striker, uh, two Moth, two Night Haunts, a T Pit, two Terror Hounds, two Oblivion, and two Whip Tongue. These, uh, the man is actually exactly balanced at 23 and 23 as it is right now. So I would guess that the person who's building the deck either didn't have uh, more Terror Pits or. Uh, they just really wanted to keep that mana exactly balanced. Personally, I'd rather play Terror Pits over Root Traps. Root Trapping a 4-drop feels pretty bad, unless it's absolutely critical. I'd rather Vine Bind that. But, um, again, if resources are limited or something, uh, or this is like a draft deck, for example. This is a draft deck. This is a great draft deck. You are winning your draft, almost definitely. Um, then, or you really value just having that equal mana numbers, then this is great. Um... So, that's the end of the deck profile. This is the Darkness Nature. I think we, call, we called it a mid-range initially, but I, it's definitely more of an aggro. Um, let me know what you think. Like, comment, subscribe. Uh, see you guys later. Peace.